So hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming back again to Migration and the Mother, which will be continued. We're absolutely delighted to be here. And um, I'm wearing my universal goddess symbol here, which is a uh, sun and a moon. And we'll be talking not just goddess symbols, but also ancestral totems. But I'm going to hand over to Laura Coppin to just talk a little bit about the tech for tonight. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. So welcome. Um, I would like to apologize again that we had to postpone. Uh, it was various problems on my end, both in the flesh and the tech. So thank you all for being here tonight as well. Um, just to ask you to put any questions in the Q&A box, if that's OK, um, because using the chat is distracting for the wonderful artists while they are talking. So if there's anything urgent and it's not picked up in the Q&A, you can use the chat, obviously, but otherwise, please stick to that and we will answer it all at the end. Yes, fantastic. And also, sorry that we can't see everybody all the way through, but at the end, we'll have everybody in. And if you have any goddess symbols or ancestral totems, it'd be great if you could show them then. So we're going to start with some thanks. Thank you to our mentors, Mandy Curtis and 18 Hours, and thanks to the Arts Council of England, who funded the Goddess Lounges. And just to say that all the artists are paid, although we do need to get a little bit of match funding, £200 per show, but anything that we raise over that amount will go this month to Anna Madeka's Madeka Foundation. So I'm just going to hand over to Anna to talk about that a little bit. Good evening, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So the Modeka Foundation was set up in 2011 to help disadvantaged children and uh, orphans with uh, education. Um, and since then, we've built a school, we've done a sanitary project uh, for, for girls, uh, we've built boreholes, assembly points, and we're in the middle of um, working on a vegetable and poultry project at the school you see in the picture. Currently, we support um, five schools in and uh, around Harare. And yes, that's the Modeka Foundation. Fantastic, thank you. And Anna, you are a Zimbabwean UK storyteller, umbera player, singer, actress, dancer, everything. But just for now, can you sing us into this first, no, this third goddess? <laughs> thank you. So this is a, a Shona song, which is called Kwaziwai Mose, which means hello, everybody. You can join in with clapping. Participation is very much part of uh, coming together in my culture. So we just clap three times like this. Uh, gentlemen, you clap like this. So every time we sing. So here we go. Kwazi wai mose magadini ko Kwazi wai mose magadini ko Kwazi wai mose magadini ko Magadini ko Fantastic. Thanks very much, Anna. And without more ado, we're going to go to Paola Balbi, Artistic Director of Raconta Mianastoria, as she tells us about the migration of the Magna Mater from the Goddess Temple in Rome. was the year 205 before Christ. The city of Rome, the whole region and the whole of Italy have been under siege for months due to a terrible war, under siege by the army of Hannibal and his elephants all the way from Carthage in North Africa. But then the oracle had spoken. Only the great mother will save the eternal city of Rome. And therefore the senators have sent their ambassadors to Troades, the region where once stood the ancient city of Troy, asking to send over the statue of Kivelis, the great mother, and her sacred black stone. 
And now the statue of the great mother is sailing towards Rome on board of a ship with red sails. Today, the whole city is going to welcome it in the harbor of Ostia. The oracle had said as well, only chaste and pure hands shall be able to take the goddess from the harbor to the city. Claudia Pulcra is sitting in her house and she is combing her hair, or better, her slave is combing her hair for her. She has chosen her tunic very carefully and her scarf. Still, she knows that they would talk. They call her sharp-tongued, unchaste and unpure, the other matrons. But this is because she would not overlook injustice nor hypocrisy. She would speak it out loud and this is why they do not like her. Well, let them talk. Today she is going to honor her name, Claudia Pulcra, Claudia the Beautiful. She will look stunning and she will enjoy the celebration in full. Everyone was looking at the horizon, staring at the waves for the first one to spot the red sails of the great ship carrying the statue of Kibelis, the great mother, all the way from Troy to the ancient city of Rome. Everyone waiting, when all of a sudden, a commotion crossed the crowd. Somebody had seen it approaching. The sailors set down the sails and started to row towards the shore, when all of a sudden, tum, the great ship got stuck right in the middle of the mouth of the river Tiber, where the harbour of Rome was. A shiver crossed the crowd. That was indeed a bad omen. All the senators took the ropes on their shoulders and started to pull and pull, but the boat remained stuck. The oracle had spoken, only virtuous hands will be able to carry the goddess to town. And here now, all the matrons, virtuous and chaste women of great fame, they approached with their elegant tunics and their capes. They stretched their thin hands and they took the rope on their shoulders and they started to pull, but nothing. Claudia, Claudia Pulcra approached. Oh, magna mate, se queste mani sono pure, tu mi seguirai. You shall follow me. And gently, she picked the rope that everyone else had dropped. She carried it on her shoulders and gently she started to pull and walk towards the city. And as if by miracle, the ship started following her as a leaf on the tide. A cheer ran through the crowd. Strong hands lifted Claudia as a goddess herself, and she was carried in triumph with the goddess all the way to the Palatine Hill, where from that day on she had a place of honor next to the great goddess. Well, I love that story. I remember the first time that you told it to me, Paola. I've loved it for a long time. But there's one thing that fascinates me. Can you just Talk about pure hands. What, what do they mean to you? Pure hands for me means clean hands, literally. Uh, clean from uh, hypocrisy, clean from prejudice, uh, clean and uh, free to speak the truth. And, really, and clean from the expectation that other people have on you. 
Right. So kind of like incisive hands. Yes. And I know she's very beautiful, Claudia Pulcre, but she's got this other side, this this other side. Um, Umi, I think we're going to go to Umi now to talk about the nature of Indian goddesses and how they've got so many multiple aspects. They're not just one sweet goddess, lots of different things. So, Laura, if you could show that film. Thanks, Paula. So you have... Um, Parvati, the devoted wife of Shiva, who in her aroused aspect, when something makes her angry, is Kali, the ferocious Kali, um, who when angry tramples on the chest of her husband. But she's also a very powerful protective deity that people worship because she is a protectress. Um, and the same with Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, who is always portrayed sitting in a lotus, very gracious and graceful and beautiful, dressed all in pink with gold coins showering from her hands, who in her aroused aspect is Durga, the goddess of war, who rides on a tiger and has arms bristling with ferocious weapons. Fantastic. And I think, Umi, you've got your Nag Devi symbol, which we saw in the first little excerpt of Migration and the Mother. Have you got it there? I have indeed. Here she is. Um, and yes, she's a minor Indian goddess. She's not terribly well known. I'm just trying to get the whole of her into the picture. Um, I think she's beautiful. She's ethereal. She's earthy. She's sensual. And she definitely isn't to be messed with. Fantastic. And actually, um, we've had some wonderful contributions from Janet North, who lives in Hove. And I don't know if you can show the pictures there, Laura, but she made, in response to last month's Goddess Lounge, a griffin out of bird seed. And I think the griffin is a bit similar. It's got wings and claws. And also this upcycled goddess, this garden earthy goddess, and she's got wings there. So, yes, I think I have to send ja Janet. She's already had... Your Planet Needs You by Bernadette Vallely, and I think next she's going to get Goddesses and Heroines. So, um, yes, Paula, I just wanted to ask you, does Nag Devi ring any bells with you? Does it make you think of any Italian stories? Yes. For many years, one of my favorite stories that I tell, it's uh, from the Celtic Italian tradition from North Italy, and it speaks about the serpent or a dragon woman. Uh, it's a beautiful lady that a king meets in the woods and she agrees to marry him on the terms that every Thursday she's going to have her bath alone and nobody should ever follow her, not even her husband. But her husband will betray her trust and out of anger and sorrow she will grow a snake tail and great butt wings and she will quit him forever. Although many centuries after, she will reappear and live happily with another knight that will accept her in her snake form. Mm, fantastic. I love the fact that she bathes on a Thursday night. I wonder if there's any significance. I bet it's the last Thursday of the month as well. So we're all kind of bathing here. And as Aphrodite would say, renewing our virginity in the ocean. Yes. So, yeah, I think that's a fantastic story, Paola. But what to you, what does it actually mean? I think uh, the story means that everyone needs their own secret, their own uh, uh, mysterious part. So even in couples, there is always something, there's always a side that you should hide and has the right to remain hidden. Mm, mm. I know stories mean lots of different things to lots of different people. Umi, I wonder if it means anything different to you. Um, I think to me it says how damaging it is to try to own a woman. Mm. Yeah. Mm. To own anyone, I think it's always uh, not a good idea to own uh, a man from a woman perspective and to own one's children as well. They do not belong to you. Yeah. And definitely not a good idea to own a goddess either. And if goddesses are incarnations of the earth, maybe it's talking about the earth needing mystery spaces to reseed, rewild and regain her strength. 
So, yes, thanks, Paula and Umi. I think we'll go now to Anna Medeka and hear of her strong women and the migration that she made from Zimbabwe via her ancestors to the UK. Thanks, Laura. Who am I? I'll tell you who I am. I'm a descendant of the biggest ancestral migration of the Bantu tribe from the Tanganyika and Baka tribal regions. I come from the center of the earth where the equator line cuts the world in two from a time before a small group of white men played dominoes with the land and the scrabble for Africa began. My name is Anna Mudeka, and this is my story. My ancestors come from the true cradle of life, where the first woman walked the earth. Our belief in Imadzimu holds that the ancestral spirits may choose to return in times of crisis. My great ancestor, Neanda, walked out of Guru Uswa, the tall, dense grass at the center of the earth, 70,000 years ago. It was many years later that the ancestors grew restless. You must leave, they told the people. They looked up and saw Hongwe, the fish eagle, circling as the elders spoke of faraway places. The great Bantu migration began. The people followed where Hongwe led, and when they grew tired, Hongwe circled above and waited while people rested. Many years later, the great bird finally landed and the people laid the first stone of the great Zimbabwe Mabwe Empire. The sun rose with the spirits of my ancestors between the mighty Yambeja River, which gushes down at Mosiwo Tunya and snakes alongside the Pororotemata River all the way to the Indian Ocean. King Nyatsimba Mutota, the first warrior prince of the Mwenemutapai, dynasty, was father to Nyamika Charwe, who embodied the ancestral spirit of Mbuya Nehanda, who gifted us rain and good harvest. Ngainai! Nehanda is my ancestor, and I'm filled with pride. She's the lion spirit. She's bound to our Bantu heritage by the lion totem. Shikiro Yemondoro, as am I. My totem is Sokomukanya, the baboon. Sokomungane, the one who gathers the people. And Vasika Navachitonga, female leader. Imagine how our history would be shaped today. If Cecil Rhodes had never set foot there, at first we thought, <laughs> it's the bloody British sense of humor. Taxation on my hat, which I built with my own hands, I have to pay you for my hat? What is this taxation? From the heart of the great Zimbabwe Mabwe Empire, the House of Stones, Mbuyane Handacharwe led the first Chimurenga War. In Matabele land, they called it Umvuhela, and it was Queen Lozi Kainjanjo who stepped in. She supported Nehanda to unite the tribes. After many months of fighting, Mbuya Nehanda was finally captured alongside her accomplice Kagui. They walked hands bound, heads held up. They faced their execution with grim courage. 
Mbiyane and his last words were, My bones will rise again. My bones shall rise again. My bones will rise again. Anna after my grandmother. She was a powerful woman. She would use storytelling to diffuse squabbling amongst us. Bye, Vapo, she would call out. Bye, Vapo. Bye, Vapo. And one by one would answer. Zepunde. 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 Bye, Vapo. Zepunde. Bye, Vapo. Bye, Vapo. And the stories would begin. How Tsuro always outwitted the baboon. How the children got in trouble for not listening to the adults. And my favorite story of all. The story of the poor quiet man who ended up with the most beautiful girl in the village. My grandmother was one of the last in our family to truly hold the sacred songs of the ancestors. She would sing at the birth of a new child in the township. She would lay to rest the dying. There were many songs and dances of different Shona tribes in Rugare, but also the Chewa and the Nyanja, economic migrants from Malawi who had come to work for the railways. Our community was so rich for having them amongst us. Just simply observing their Chinamari ceremony or their Nyao dance or just their greeting in the streets was fascinating. I have fond memories of the time I spent with my great-grandmother in the village. Eating boiled pumpkins, sweetened by the heat from the sun. Boiled vegetables and ground nuts fused with smoke and tea made from grinded tata seeds. <laughs> Those were the days of song. The song of strong women. From Buyane Handa. Char, wenyaka sikana. Queen Lozi Kei. Mazuona. Buya Mudeka. Buya Chikundi. And my dear mother, Evelyn. <laughs> I climbed the steps to the aeroplane at Harare International Airport. I didn't know when I was going to see Zimbabwe again. I waved goodbye to the strong line of women who stood behind me from Buyanehanda to my mother. And as the plane lifted and my old world hid from view, I held my mbira, my hope, and had no idea what waited for me the other side of the world. London. I looked around trying to identify some of the places I'd seen on postcards in Zimbabwe. Tall skyscrapers, clean streets, Harold's, Beckingham Palace. But I couldn't see them from the window of my dingy little flat in Walthamstow. There were so many different nationalities in London. What struck me the most was how closed everybody was. It was a city of Mazjake Mazjake, each to their own. So I moved on to Norwich. Sometimes I'd close my eyes and see Hongwe, the fish eagle, leading me away. And I would ask myself, what am I doing here? Where am I going? I missed my grandmother so much. 
I reached back to the strong line of women and asked, What would you do in this situation? My passion, my love, my music was dying. So one day, I just walked out with the clothes I was wearing and I never turned back. I asked myself, what if, what if, what if? Freeing myself made me realize what I could do. I followed Hongwe in my dreams and I glided. Having lived in two cultures, I found myself looking for a deeper desire to understand who I was. I was searching for a meaning not defined by external events, but rooted in something much deeper. As I looked out of the window at the English countryside, I could see Hongwe, the fish eagle, circling, calling me to climb upon her back, calling me back to Guru Uswa, to the land of the ancestors, the birthplace of all life on earth. There, I could walk in the tall grass and understand my true place on this earth. In Zulu, we say umuntu, ngumuntu, ngabantu. A person is a person because of other people. It's been hard, but I've made the most out of the two cultures I live in. I touch the soil of Zimbabwe. I wear Zimbabwe inside me like an inner skin. It is my heartbeat. But I carry England with me too. When I'm in Zimbabwe, I feel the same breeze sing through the Mumbamaropa and Jacaranda trees, and I know it sings in the beech and pine trees the other side of the world. Thank you. Tatenda. Tatenda, thank you, Anna. I just, uh, I'm so overwhelmed by how many phrases that keep resonating with me. I love that one. I wear Zimbabwe like an inner skin. I think that's utterly beautiful. But I want to go to Umi Sinha now, creative writing tutor for New Writing South and author of Belonging, um, just to see what your responses are Umi, to that film. We're going to be hearing about your migration from India to the UK via your novel soon. But yes, anything leap out? Um, well, there were, there were lots of things, actually. But I think the first thing was the lion totem, because my surname, Sinha, actually means lion, as would sing. It's... Um, and I, I've always loved lions. And in fact, my when Anna did that, my profile picture, which is actually on the poster, where I've got my arms up like that, is actually taken at Baalbek with me holding the face of a lion. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. So basically, you're probably you, you would probably have the lion as your totem if you were born in, in Zimbabwe. Anna, do you, do you think that's the case? Do you think Umi would have had the lion? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, when now we did the show last week, just listening to her and India talk, there was something very much I identified with the lion from what uh, India was saying. And I hadn't actually made the, the connection that, um, you know, there was um, there was a lion totem there already. Just tell us a little bit more about totems, if you can. So in, um, in our culture, when you... Um, uh, the, the totem you're given is uh, through ancestry. So it usually comes from the father's side of the family. So I'm born Soko Mkanya because my father was Soko Mkanya. So was his father and, and so on. Um, so uh, the Mondoro totem, the lion totem, uh, you can have as well both male and female. There are so many different totems. You've got the crocodile, you've got the eland, the antelope. But... The lion totem, the women are so, so powerful. They are just strong that even they, they choose not to marry, but when they do, the roles are reversed straight away. All they do is just give birth and the man does everything, washing up, cleaning, looking after the kids. They have such power and um, strength in them. Sounds like paradise. And I see that you've got the baboon there. Yes, so this is uh, Sogomukanya, my totem, where, you know, we, we gather people together and there is also qualities of female leadership. Ah, I just wanted to ask you, you know, do you look around people here in the UK and think, oh, you know, their totem must be this or that or 
the other animal. It's when you start talking to people, you you start looking at the characteristics and you very much, I've met so many Mondoros uh, um, in this, um, you know, country, uh, but also meet uh, Sokomukanyas and all the other, you know, you look at the crocodile, you know, our our current president, he's quite proud to be called the crocodile and <laughs> he does have uh, characteristics of a crocodile. <laughs> right. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Paula, what do you think your totem would be? Um, I always <clears throat> recognize myself as a tortoise <laughs> or a turtle. I know it might seem strange to people who know me, but uh, the turtle goes slow, but she always gets where she wants to get. And I think her major characteristic, as the ancient Romans thought, it's not the slowness, it's the hardness of the shell. A truck can pass over a tortoise shell and she will keep on walking. Yeah, I've got to take this off, sorry. Um, that's why I always call you the captain. If I was on a ship, you would be the sailor. But Thank I know, you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I would be the crew, though, because I wouldn't be good enough. But um, I just I know you had a drama school training, as I did. And I, I don't know what your animal was at drama school, but I wanted to be a giraffe because I kind of you know, fancied the sort of thing. I went to see the giraffes and they, they just stand around licking branches all day. And I was told I had to be a tiger. And I said, no, it's the last thing I want to do. And I couldn't do it until I looked in the eyes of the tiger. And then I got it. But it opened up a kind of fierceness in me um, that I don't think really necessarily suited me. Um, but anyway, talking of fierceness, I want to go back to you, uh, Umi, again, and because I know there must be so many parallels, you having worked on your film about migration. Anything else that leaps out of uh, to you from Anna's film? Yes, when she was talking about the bones rising again, it really reminded me both her gesture and the power of her voice of um, Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise, which is, um, there's actually a video of her doing it on YouTube and it is really inspiring. I'm sure she's a Mandoro. <laughs> um, and the other thing about it was that in my book, I actually mention an uprising in India in 1857 when the army and civilians rose against the British and basically massacred a lot of them. And it was the one period in history probably where the British experienced what it was like to be refugees, to be driven out of your home, have your homes destroyed and be thrown upon the mercy of the local population, many of whom actually took them in and sheltered them. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you've got something to say about the taxes as well. Well, yes, I mean, the taxes was a common thing with colonialism. Um, I mean, the, the most obvious example that comes to mind for me um, about the kind of exploitation was um, the British, the, basically people in India had always made their own salt. They went down to the sea and they panned for salt and either to sell or to for their own purposes. And the British decided that they would control the salt and actually um, made it illegal for Indians to go to the beach and collect salt. It was, um, the production was basically controlled by the British and Indians then had to buy salt. Wow. I just want to ask you, Anna, how does this reflect on the Black Lives Matter movement today? Should we still be talking about these things? I, I think we should, because when the argument is, is taken, it's always coming from the side of the privileged. Um, we should still talk, because in a lot of countries in Africa, the effects are still being felt, so much so that, you know, countries like Ivory Coast, uh, they still rent uh, buildings from France, so all the money is still coming back to, to Europe. So we should still talk about it until there is a, a level playing field. And I know you talk about the preservation of culture being so important. What role do you think the mother tongue plays in this? I know your your first language is Shona, is that right? Yes, yes. So uh, through, this, through the singing that I do and, you know, I, I always want to talk to my own people in our language, but that's that's becoming a little bit of a struggle as well because it's it's so quick for people to converse in, in English uh, but, you know, slowly by 
singing and still talking. That's how we can preserve our, our own language. Mm. I know Paolo was talking about mystery spaces and we were talking about how the land needs to reseed itself, etc. But what was your ancestors' concept of ownership when it came to land? They didn't understand this obsession about owning land. It's, it's not ours to own. We are just guardians passing through and we, we look after it while we're here and then when we go, we leave it to the next generation. The idea of owning land is still very alien to my great ma grandmother who lives in the village because, you know, the land is there to be plowed and to be looked after and then you leave it down to the next generation. It's, yeah. it's bizarre that the obsession of, you know, 99-year leases, council tax, housing tax, this tax. Yeah. And finally, how do people view women today in Africa by contrast to how women were viewed in the time of your ancestors? The women still are, are the doers from what I grew up seeing and what I still see. You know, they get things done. And um, if you look back to Nehanda's time, they were even more powerful, you know, in terms of putting tribes and uh, people together. That only changed when the colonials then started coming. And that was also at the time when um, they, were, they were burning the witches. But actually, it was the wise women that they were uh, accusing of being witches here. And that kind of came to Africa as well. And the the roles have now been reversed so much that, you know, you can see the wisdom, the, the practicalities of, of the African woman, but she's still having to, to be under the, the husband or under the, the father's rule. And we didn't used to have that. No, but I, I, I imagine your grandmother wasn't like that. <laughs> no, she was completely different. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the... <laughs> Yeah, uh, but just before we go to Umi's film about migration, I just want to, to show a little film about Tara and my ancestors, because for me, I like what you say about ancestors. The goddess kind of connects with my grandmother, my parents, as well as ancestors. So uh, thanks to Laura for her manifold help with this film that I'm going to show you in a minute. And also to Jill Greenhalgh, the section about letters is very much inspired by her workshop, Daughter, which hopefully will come to the Goddess Festival in October. So Laura, if we could just see that film. There was once a girl who had lost everything, mother, father, country, home. She took shelter in a cave and on the cave wall was a painting of the goddess Tara. Tara adorned in all her finery. Tara arrayed with all her charms, all her symbols. Sun jewel, moon jewel, mirror, knife, water. The girl felt so impoverished, she cried and cried so hard that Tara stepped out of the picture and adorned the girl with all her finery. Adorned the girl with all her symbols, sun jewel, moon jewel, knife to cut away the dead wood of the past right back to the green shoot, the green bud, water to heal. The goddess Tara, totally naked, leapt back into the painting, danced for a second and the girl was able to make her way in the world. This true story is composed of cine film taken by my mother, directed and edited by Cathy Coulter. When I was four, I found the world so mysterious. I'd always ask my mother questions. Where does the sun go? Who's eaten the moon? Where's Daddy? She said, you won't be seeing Daddy anymore. He'd been ill for a long time. She arranged for us to go to the beach.
and made as matching sunflower toweling robes. She loved to make things, and when she sewed something for herself, she'd make a mini version for me. I love my toweling wrap. I love my sunflowers. We went to a beach in Brittany called La Bole. It's famous for being five miles long. I was collecting shells, Venus clams, blue mussels, those ridgy scallops. Only whole shells with a creature inside. I lifted the hem of my sunflower wrap to make them a nest. I love my toweling wrap. I love my sunflowers. I was paddling, spinning and singing. <laughs> and somehow I went right along the beach and panicked. I'd lost my father, now my mother. I dropped all my shells and ran into the sea. For some reason I thought they both might be there. Two women in black costumes took me back to shore, but I ran off. Then I saw one of those orange camp beds with a woman asleep. I knew she was English. It was the Tupperware. One of my tears fell on her skin and she woke up. I've lost my mummy! She was kind and told me not to worry, we'd find her. She took me to a bar with a thatched roof and sat me on a stool. I didn't want a drink or an ice cream. I just kept crying, I've lost my mummy! After a while, the woman asked if my mum had been wearing a toweling wrap like mine. I looked up and saw my beautiful mother striding along the beach, handkerchief balled in her fist, looking from sea to sand, sand to sea. Mummy! We ran towards each other like a slow-mo moment in a movie. She scooped me up and spanned me round. I love my toweling wrap. I love my sunflowers. I thought you'd drowned, she said. Recently, I did lose my mother. When I left her in the hospice, I decided to leave with her body a sunflower. I couldn't think why it felt so right. I wondered if it was that in French, sunflower is tournesol, because they turn towards the light. And then I remembered this story. For me, goddess philosophy works a little bit like water that slowly fills up the gaps that loss has left. The goddess Tara can be green like a deep lake or white like sea spray. Our family outings often centred around water. These are the well dressings, pictures of flowers next to water sources. That's my grandmother there and her maiden name is Wells and she's with my great grandmother who is also a Wells. So you've got the Wells beside the Wells my grandmother photographing and my mother filming. This is Monsell Dale, where we'd often go on church family outings. This is my mum and my brother. Oops. And this is the handbag. When I was younger, nobody spoke about my father, so I was always gathering clues about him and their relationship, and he gave her this bag. I see it a little bit like a double shell, a mother's side, a father's side, and inside. Here's another shell. It's one of the symbols of Tara, a conch, spiralings of infinity, but also spiralings of children, parents, grandparents, ancestors. But what about my mother's symbols, my mother's charms? Here's her charm bracelet. This is a mining lantern because my father was a mining engineer from Derbyshire. Here's a London bus. It opens like a lot of these charms. My mother was from South East London. There's a Bible here because they met at a Christadelphian Bible conference in 1956. And here is some sheet music and their theme tune around about this time was Alma Cogan's You, Me and Us. They were married after two years of intense courtship. Like 
is Eros, and they went on their honeymoon to Cornwall. And we've got a lobster pot here with baby lobster inside. These are my parents' love letters. Here's a picture of my father. In Tara philosophy, you conjure up an image of the goddess and see yourself reflected. I used to do something similar with this photo because I had no recollection of my father. My mother had had this picture since she was 19. In April 56, she writes, I have just sat for a moment looking out at my dressing table. In front of me, there are two ornaments, a Russian comb, a clock, a Bible, a powder bowl, and your photo in its frame. It's marvellous. It's so real, darling. It's no wonder I talk to it. They say that love is only a hairbreadth from madness, and I think I've bridged that little gap. Who cares? I'm loving every minute of it. Clearly, my father wants something similar of her for himself, because in his next letter, he's looking at polyphotos of her. These are polyphotos of him. Your polyphotos are driving me crazy. I've even had a magnifying glass on the job. It's between 19 and 41. 19 is full-faced, serious. I love it, but I don't think it would look so good when enlarged. 41 is a doodle. It's just the look you have before you start laughing. This is what finally arrives. I'm so thrilled. I'm so happy. I'm like a child bubbling up with confident, trusting laughter. I just keep looking at it and looking at it. I say, I love you, darling. I love you, darling. My throat tightens, my stomach tenses, my heart starts pounding and I feel like my head will burst. All my blood seems to course and surge through my veins. Dear, please take care of yourself. If anything happened to you, the light would go out of my life and I would be a cracked, hollow shell of a man. This is my mother's paternal grandmother with whom she felt a great affinity. She inherited many proverbs and sayings from my great-grandmother. Red shoes, no knickers and stories. In our day, we had oil lamps and oil was expensive, so you'd turn them off, go to bed and indulge. Like my mother, my great-grandmother had a passionate marriage. This is Frank Parker. He was in the 18th Regiment, the Hussars, the Cavalry of the 1418 War. One afternoon, my mother went round and found her grandmother ankle deep in love letters and telegrams, weeping and weeping. I always thought he'd walk through that door. He was lucky, he had a lucky streak. He never did, and my mother felt that history had repeated itself. Great-grandmother had to look after four children on her own. That's Eric Parker, my grandfather. And my mother had to look after two. But the affinities don't stop there. My great-grandfather didn't have a burial place except in a poppy or a heart or a photograph, and my father was the same. For religious reasons, no burial place. My brother and I made ashes of a letter and took them to the River Dove in Derbyshire. When my mother died, we took some of her ashes to the same river so the two could be together in the water. Seven years into their marriage, my father had to go on a business trip to America, and he writes from Detroit. We are now so much entwined together that apart we lose half ourselves. And he sends this postcard from the local museum. It's of Tara. You, me, and, I, and on the back he writes, makes me so homesick. We all go together like peaches and cream, our bells with a church and a steeple. Some people I know, I'm fond of and so All day I keep singing about them For one of them's you, and darling it's true I find that I can't live without them You, me and us We are my favorite people
Laura. I should say that Tara is a non-binary goddess, so she's both male and female. It might make a bit of sense of that film. But Paula, you've got a Tara story, haven't you? Yes. Tara is a very important uh, goddess and a very important energy for my life as well. My daughter's best friend is named Tara, and she's an Indian girl. When we migrated from Italy to Dubai, my daughter was three, (laughs) and she wasn't happy at all. She was grieving about her friends back in Italy, and she didn't speak any English. The first day in nursery, she was completely lost. But this Indian girl, Tara, she approaches her and she stretches her hand and she gives her hand to my daughter. And off they go together. And they have been inseparable since. Uh, so much so that when we decided to move back to Italy, the two girls were grieving so much that Tara said, I, I don't want to make any more friends. I, I will sit here and mourn. And my daughter also on her side, she didn't want to speak Italian anymore. She didn't want to know anything about our life in Italy, that we decided to go back. And now we live in between six months in Italy, six months in Dubai for them to be together. And uh, once we told them, look, when you met each other, you didn't even understand each other as Maria Vittoria spoke no English. But Tara said, this is a lie. I always understood her. That is such a fantastic story. She's an extraordinary girl, your daughter, and I'm sure Tara is too. But Tara, Tara as a goddess, migrates. Uh, She starts off in India as Uma or Devi and then goes off to China, Tibet, and even Ireland. Uh, You know, I love the vowels, so you get, what would it be? Um, Uma, U-A, Tara, A-A, E, Devi. Anyway, uh, let's go to... Umi Sinar's story of migration. Thank you, Laura. Hello, I'm Umi Sinar, and this is my novel, Belonging. It's set out in India during the period of the British Raj. It's the story of three generations of a British colonial family. It's a novel of family secrets, but it also documents the relationship between the British and the Indians, the oppressors and the oppressed and the damage that it does to both. When the novel starts, Leela Langdon, who's 12, has just witnessed a family tragedy, as a result of which she's put onto a ship in the company of a stranger and sent to Sussex to live with her great aunt Wilhelmina, who she's never met. The first thing my great aunt Wilhelmina said when she met me off the boat was, you may call me Aunt Mina, and I shall call you Lillian. As for India and the past, we shall never speak of either again. I had opened my mouth to greet her, but I looked up into her cloudy brown eyes and closed it again. I stared out the window as we drove to her house. It was the middle of August and everything was unfamiliar. The sun was a hazy glow behind a pale gray sky. There were drab people walking along empty streets and no colours or smells. Even the sounds were tinny and unreal and I was cold, colder than I had ever been although they told me it was summer. High Elms, Aunt Mina's square white Georgian house, lies in a small Sussex village in a fold of the South Downs. Inside the large house, I felt stifled by the thick muffling curtains and soft carpets, the heavy dark furniture and brooding silence. In India, my window had always stood open at night and the voices of the servants, their laughter and quarrels and the smell of their cooking drifted in on the warm night air. Here, my room was on the first floor at one end of a long corridor and the rest of the floor was empty, except for Aunt Mina's room at the other end. At night, no sounds came up from below, and the silence was so profound that I imagined that everyone had died and that I would wake up in the morning and find myself alone. Night after night, 
I had the same dream, which I still have sometimes. It's dark, and I'm back in Peshawar, walking up the drive to our bungalow. It lies quiet, its whitewashed walls glimmering in the moonlight, punctuated by the shadowy rectangles of its windows and the open front door. I go inside and walk through the empty rooms. All the furniture is gone, and I can feel sand blown in from the desert, gritty under my feet. In my bedroom, the windows stand open. The muslin curtains float upwards, and the strong, sweet smell of Rat Kirani drifts into the room on the night air. Hindus believe that when you cross the ocean, which they call the Kalapani, or black water, you lose your caste. And your caste defines your place in the world, where you belong, and ultimately who you are. You become an outcast. My own experience, even though I am not a Hindu, tells me that this is true. Hello, this is my daughter, India. So um, growing up throughout most of my childhood, you were working on belonging. And I was wondering if you could start by telling us why you chose to set your story during the period of the British Raj. I chose that period, I think, because the overriding search in my life has been for a sense of belonging. And colonialism is the reason I exist. I'm actually a product of it because my parents met. My parents would never have met if it hadn't been for colonialism. My father was over in Britain during the war and he met my mother in 1945, just before he returned to India. She went out to marry him in 1948. And as with many people during colonialism, there was a certain confusion of identity. My father during the war had tried his best to fit in with the other British officers and assumed many of the kind of mannerisms and behavior of the British. My mother, on the other hand, came out to India and wanted to fit in with the other Indian naval officers' wives. And she actually began to wear saris and dyed her hair black and tried to be as Indian as possible. So there was a certain confusion of identity there, which I think mirrored the fact that thousands of British people during um, the colonial period had gone out to the colonies all over the world at a very young age, spent all their lives in the colonies and then returned to Britain when they retired or when independence came to find they no longer felt they belonged. And Indians who had come over to Britain to be educated or to fight in the military also returned to India feeling that they no longer fitted in with their very traditional cultures. I find it particularly interesting hearing you talk about how your parents both tried to take on aspects of each other's culture through the clothes they wore, um, the way they spoke and things, um, because it's something we've been talking a lot about recently with my brother, Jared, um, about identity and how difficult it can be when you're not sure what aspects of a mixed heritage you're allowed to lay claim to. Um, so because I look white, I've always felt that I wasn't really allowed to um, to own some aspects of my Indian heritage and that um, somehow I was appropriating or pretending or exaggerating um, if I spoke about myself as part Indian, um, although it does come up because of my name and the way I dress. Um, whereas my brother, who looks a lot more Indian than I do, has a very different experience because people tend to assume that he's mixed race and to ask him about that. So he doesn't get a lot of choice in the way that he identifies um, and the way that people perceive him. And I was quite curious um, about the character of Leela in your book, because she comes to England from India and has a difficult time um, identifying where she belongs and how to characterize herself. Um, so I was quite curious about how her experiences in the novel reflect the way you felt growing up in India and then coming to Britain um, as a teenager and realising that perhaps you didn't belong in the way that you expected to. I think what I shared with Leela when I arrived in this country was the feeling of sensory deprivation. That description of her arriving in Britain and her experience is very much based on my own. Um, 
what I didn't share was the feeling of bereavement she had at leaving India, because I think the British were very at home in India in a way that I wasn't as a child, because I never felt I belonged there. And that was because as a half caste, as we were known, you were made to feel very strongly that you didn't belong, um, that you were a social outcast. Um, the Indians basically felt because you didn't belong to any particular community, you were an outcast. The British tended to regard people of mixed blood as um, inheriting the worst traits of both races. So you were regarded as weak, treacherous, and prone to criminality. Um, but because I think the big cultural influence in our home was my mother, and um, the education system was still very British based. I grew up feeling a lot more at home with British culture than with Indian culture. And all through my childhood, I dreamed of coming to England and how once we got here, I would feel at home. I would belong at last. I arrived in 1968, which was the year that Enoch Powell made his Rivers of Blood speech about the dangers of immigration and how blood would flow in the streets if it continued. And the it was shortly after the influx of Asians from Uganda. And so it felt a bit like falling out of the frying pan into the fire. And that feeling of um, not belonging persisted basically because I realized once I got to England that wherever you are, it's always the other half of you that people see. So in Britain, I was always half Indian. In India, I was always half British. Um, so you're always othered. But as I've grown older, I've realized that actually that position of being the other is incredibly useful, especially as a writer, because it enables you to look into the society you're in with objective eyes. You're, it's not the water you swim in, it's alien to you. Um, and that is a big advantage. And the other thing I think as a human being is that it gives you more empathy and more insight into what things are like for people of other cultures. Um, and that is a richness that I really would not ever want to give up now. Well, I just really can't recommend this book enough. I mean, you heard how beautifully it was written. I love that phrase. Um, the the the, rock, the smell of rock Irani on the sweet night air or something. It's full of stuff like that. And also it's a riveting read. It's not just got lots of his history in it. It's very empathetically written. I think Umi was accused of being too empathetic at certain points. And the it just builds to the most extraordinarily unforgettable climax. So it is an amazing read and we could talk all night about it. But... I'd like to go back to Paula because there has been some requests from our first migration and the mother for you, Paula, to talk a little bit more about your experience of an orgasmic birth. Uh, so when I was uh, pregnant, halfway through, I felt treated like a, an ill person. So I decided I would never go back again to the gynecologist who followed me. And I decided to follow the path of the natural birth. And when I mean natural, I mean uh, fundamentalist <laughs> natural. So I researched for a birth uh, place and uh, I gave birth in the water only with midwives, no doctors, no needles, nothing. And uh, I researched about the natural birth and I I learned that our body, our women body are able to give birth by ourselves. We are perfectly able to, um, to live through the pain of childbirth if we are left in peace and we can make our body work. And the channel of pleasure is the same channel where the children are born. So with masturbation, you can help childbirth and you can regulate your pains through through labor and have a pleasurable birth. <laughs> so this is what I did. And I heard the midwife saying, oh, look how she's following her instincts. 
And I looked down and there is when I realized I was masturbating myself while giving birth. Wow. I'm sure a lot of people would have liked to have heard that story before uh, going into birth, but what a fantastic technique to help you through so many things in life, I'm sure. Um, Paula, brilliant. And I thought it was great to have that story there before we show our final film for this evening about the Magna Mater, the great mother, as you are on so many levels. Once upon a time, when there was nothing, before everything was created, she was there, all alone in the universe, immense, beautiful, powerful, and for many thousands of years, she was busy just contemplating her perfect woman self. And then she got bored and she started thinking. And the very moment she started thinking, anything she thought of appeared. Sun and moon, stars. And she looked around and it was indeed a triumph of life, magnificent. And for some million years, she kept herself busy enjoying it. And then feeling in great creative mood, one day she made a mistake. The one and only mistake she ever made since the very beginning, she Thought, male, male, creature. And there and then Zeus appeared, the very essence of virility and manhood. And Zeus, he looked at her, at her perfect female body, and he wanted her straight away. He started burning with desire for her. She looked back at him as if to say, thank you, but I'm not interested. But he got obsessed with her. He started following her everywhere and then dreaming of her night and day, day and night, constantly thinking of her, constantly wanting to make love with her. And one day he was fast asleep on a rock and his dream of her was so intense then all of a sudden his seed sprang out of his body and reached the sky bounced on a cloud and back on the earth it penetrated the earth itself the body of the great mother and from that divine seed and divine womb, men and women were created and creatures who were both man and woman at the same time. A nymph is the second little mistake that a great mother ever did. It's the only female creature that is not perfect. A nymph is a creature that goes around idle all day, looking at things and wanting them. The nymph sees the pomegranate tree, the plump fruits, and she wants them. There and then, without thinking, she grabs one and she swallows it whole. Oh. And the divine seed in her womb they start to grow and grow and grow and grow. And within one hour, she is nine months pregnant. There and then in the woods, she delivers a child. She delivers a baby so beautiful, the like of which nobody had ever seen before on earth nor in heaven. And within a day, the baby grows into a child. The child grows into a boy. The boy grows into a teenager. The teenager grows into a fully grown 
up handsome, young, sexy man. And something happened. Something absolutely unpredictable. The great mother that all sees, all hears, all feels. With a corner of her divine eye, she sees that creature. And from the first time since the beginning of everything, she falls in love completely from head to toes, totally in love with this amazing youth. Atis is his name. Well, well, she goes on earth she calls for him and she takes him to her cave. And there she teaches him everything she knows about love and sex. And now I say, if you were in this man's shoes, if you men could become the lover of the great female perfection herself, would, not, would you not be content of your lot? Well, indeed he was for quite a while, but then one day he woke up and he, and he told to the great mother what men sometimes tell. I need some time for myself. And the great mother, she is freedom herself and the young man he gets out of the great mother's cave and he starts walking in the woods and immediately he is spotted by a nymph another nymph called Sangaride Sangaride she sees this sexy handsome young man and she wants him she approaches him she takes him under a tree and there she starts making love with him. The great mother, of course, she knows about it straight away. She sees everything. She hears everything. She feels everything. But she says nothing. She watches. And then she whistles. Through her slightly pointed the way into the young lad ears, ears, and it fills his head and turns him mad, stark mad. And the young man, there and then all naked, he lifts and he starts running. And he ran, 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 ran in madness, screaming. He ran all the way until he reached the top of a cliff overlooking the sea. And there he dived from the height. Somebody says that he smashed on the rock. And this is the end he knew. Whoever contradicts the great mother or is not content with the lot she created. But somebody else said that the very last thing, she took pity on him in her immense mercy and she stretched her hand and within her two fingers she took his tears. But such is her great strength that his body started to stretch and stretch and stretch until his arms and his head became roots and his legs and his feet and his toes became branches and he was transformed into a pine tree, a Mediterranean pine tree that ever since is sacred 
to the great mother and her lover. Wow, thanks, Paolo. I don't think we'll ever look at pine trees in the same way again. I just wanted to, to ask you, it seems to me that the ancients didn't have any of the hang-ups we have about adopting other people's religious, you know, beliefs and goddesses and gods. Well, surely the Romans uh, believed that uh, to destroy other idols' temples or uh, to not show respect to other gods would bring them bad luck. And this is why everywhere they went, they always made sure they would uh, worship the local gods and they would also build a temple for the foreign gods in Rome. Mm. Umi, have you got anything to say about that? You know, keeping your luck with having lots of gods and goddesses around. Well, yeah, I mean, Hinduism, of course, um, ironically, given what's happening in India now, is one of the most all-embracing religions because all gods are just aspects of the divine and everything is part of the divine. But when you get into a taxi in Mumbai, you'll notice that every taxi driver has on his dashboard a little statue of Ganesh, a little statue of Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary or the Virgin Mary, and a little statue often of a Muslim saint as well. So basically, they're just making sure they've covered all the bases. Yeah, and I expect they've got little lights and the lights go off when they go around corners as well, don't they? Those... Oh, yeah, they light up Ganesha's and um, three-dimensional, um, you know, the those um, shimmering three-dimensional cards. I love it, I love it. Um, but just, just go back to the little goddess that is Maria Victoria. She's got a great philosophical line on this, hasn't she, Paola, your daughter? Yes, she's very opinionated about that as well. In Dubai, her friends are all different religions. Tara is Hindu, uh, other friends are Muslim, other Christians, other, other uh, Buddhists or other religions. So one time she told me when she was five, mom, this thing about calling God different names, I think it's like a drawing. She likes, she loves drawing. And she said, if you draw a tree and I draw a tree, and uh, Tara draws a tree. Uh, all our drawings are different, but the tree is a tree. Our drawings do not change its nature. And so it's God. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Anna, have you got any thoughts on this? Oh, we can't hear you, Anna. Sorry. There is a song from Nigeria, my friend told me, and it says, we give thanks to God we give thanks to Allah, we give thanks to the ancestors. Uh, and it just resembles what everybody's saying. So it goes like this. Mungo de Allah, Mungo de Yesu, Mungo de Uwangiji, hallelujah. Mm, beautiful. Thank you so much. And just before we hand over to the audience for any questions that they might have for the artists or any symbols they want to show, I forgot to say thank you so much to Davide Bardi of Raconta Muna Storia for helping doing that film with Paola. Great. So, uh, yes, have we, Laura, could we get everybody that would like to turn their cameras on on screen? Yes, of course. So, if anyone would like to join us, please raise your hands and I will bring you through now. I'll take a moment. So I don't know if you all have any questions between you while we wait. Wow, any questions between us? Anna, did you have any thoughts about Umi's film? Um, it was very interesting. I think the title itself, Belonging, was perhaps what made me create my show as well because I was struggling with understanding where I belonged anymore. Having lived in uh, in England the same amount of time I'd lived in, in Zimbabwe and trying to make sense of those two worlds and trying to hold on to this uh, rich culture of Zimbabwe and living in a completely different culture, it, it really 
got to a stage where it was very, very upsetting for me. But I learned to find the spaces, um, like Paula was saying, my private spaces where I can go and I can be me in Zimbabwe while in England, I can vice versa in Zimbabwe, I can still have my English experience too. Back to what you were saying about having that inner skin. Mm, absolutely. So beautifully put. Well, hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Has anybody, any any of you got a, an ancestral symbol or a goddess symbol or anything there you want to show us? Fleur's got something. What's that, Fleur? <clears throat> it's a tiny little owl for Athena, goddess of war and wisdom and weaving. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it very well. Can you see it? No, I'm just imagining it, to be quite honest. I, can see <laughs> I am seeing. It's so tiny. Yeah, I really... Ah, oh, yes. Oh. Mm. This is on my, um, on my table that I've been um, doing remote teaching from. And I've got a, I've got a sort of, I don't, I don't even know why, but I'm massively drawn to this, a, an enormous sort of crystal. Um, and, and I've got a little Ganesh to remove obstacles and the owl, uh, Minerva, goddess of wisdom, war and weaving, or Athena. And that's what's carried me through remote teaching, being online all, all day, every day. I'm sure, you need, term. <laughs> I'm sure you need all the deities to help you through that. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, do we, we have, this is, has been quite a long migration in the mother, but does anybody have any questions for the artists? You can put them in the chat. You don't have to show yourself on screen. Let me have a look. Thank you for that, Mandy. So while we wait, I actually have, so if I might show it, I didn't ask you if it was okay to show this. I have this beautiful um, vulva cast I got done by an amazing woman called Lydia Reeves, who I don't know if you can, who does them for people. It's a bit bright um, and it's in gold and it's one of the most beautiful things. She's done this um, vulva diversity book to connect people just with themselves and with their bodies in a way we don't normally get to. Um, and I think it's amazing. And it's been transformative, her project for so many people. Um, and Paola, it connected a lot to what you were talking about with your experience of birth, because I feel like there's been a real disconnection between that ancient wisdom of what your body is and what it does and really connecting with yourself. And I think that almost the separation we've been forced to have between ourselves and our, and our bodies and often like our vulvas and our vaginas is a big part of almost the shaming that has got tied into birth and those processes. Um, and I'm wondering if it was a big moment for you realizing that you'd connected with yourself despite the experience you had of being made to feel sort of ashamed and ill. Yes, I, I think you're right. Um, men, many women are, are ashamed of their body parts and this is and somehow this is why they lose uh, confidence that they are powerful. And for me to, to give birth was really a Baobo moment. <laughs> yes, it was a Baobo moment. Baobo was a, the goddess of, well, she was a vagina herself and, and creatrix and, and full of humor as well. I think we need to find back the humor of our vaginas in order to enjoy them in full. Oh, please, can I just say, I want to end on that note. <laughs> end happily in every possible way, orgasmically on that note. And what better way to finish with Anna singing us out. Thank you so much to everybody for coming, <laughs> literally. <laughs> this is a, a song that comes from uh, Kenya. It's in Swahili and it's a goodbye song. Kwa heri, kwa heri, mubenzi kwa heri, kwa heri, kwa heri, mubenzi kwa heri. Tutatana tena, tukijaliwa, tutatana tena, tukijaliwa. Kwa heri, kwa heri, mubenzi kwa heri. Fantastic.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you to Anna Medeka, Paula Balbi, Umi Sinha, Laura Coppin, and hope to see you next month for April's Calendar Girl Garden Porn Star Goddess, last Thursday of the month. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Please do complete the surveys that will come out. There'll be um, another recording of the show tonight as well, if, if you have the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh...